Hey, welcome everybody. This is Vincent for the Meaningful Shit Show, and today we're going to talk about how to radically accept, believe in, and love yourself. Easy topic, not much of a challenge, should be a 10 minutes episode, right? Or maybe there's some depth to this uh, topic. Buckle in, buckaroos. Cool. So, first of all, I want to talk about why do this in the first place? Why why should you accept yourself, believe in yourself, and love yourself? Um, the why is actually really, really important. It's um, it's one of the key steps in goal achievement, is that you believe the goal or the pursuit thereof is valuable and worth continuous investment, inherently. Note that what's mentioned there is the pers- pursuit thereof. So it can't always just be the results that you're after because things might not play out in the way that you think they're going to play out. And you would really want to have decided that the investment is valuable to you, regardless of whether or not you greet the exact destination or get the results that you're actually looking for. There might be results, might be six packs, abs, or a degree, or hot sex, or a billion dollars, but it's not guaranteed to happen soon or at all. The best goals actually are the ones that you invest in regardless because it feels right to you it's in line with your values which i've spoken about uh, before and you know it fits the narrative for the life and that is a narrative that you actively construct your your hero's journey and that really ties into uh, your life being worth living at least that's the case that i'm going to build so The topic that we're talking about is a goal, just like the goals that I just spoke about, like these meaningful goals that require belief in that the investment is is worth it. And it's actually one of of the greater goals because it's not a goal that is quite attainable because the goal post constantly moves. How you love yourself today, what that means for you today, is not what that means tomorrow. You change, circumstances change, you may temporarily fall off the wagon. So it's also a goal that is a continuous choice. In order to embody it, you'll have to dedicate resources to it the rest of your life. Like with eating healthy, working out, stress reduction, mental health in general, it's it, it's always a moving target. You always have to dedicate not just time, uh, 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 like sort of automatic pilot time, Um, like you're um, doing the dishes or something like that. No, you actually have to invest conscious effort because the goalpost is constantly moving. But um, this is not a plain vanilla material goal, right? So compare that to a goal where you want to live in a house in a certain neighborhood or drive a car with a certain amount of horsepower. And although you can get that and lose it, there are more checkboxes. Right. So another thing with um, these these grander goals that I'm I'm talking about, where the goalpost continuously moves, is is also that uh, there's chapters in your your life. Um, so meaning here is that you don't have to be on on the entire time. Right. So I was mentioning before there's sometimes like an automatic pilot you can uh, you can get into. So that's more like the routine, and that can actually be really really important for a lot of these these goals that are, you know, continuously changing. It is really important to get into a routine, a structure, where you're addressing some of it on the automatic pilot. But you can take a vacation from a conscious effort or even from the automatic pilot at times. The important thing is that we come back to the investment, right? And keep investing resources. And the why is important to that. Because without a why, you're going to get distracted and you're going to go after shiny things or other things. And some situations uh, for good reasons. But let's, uh, let's, let's peel this onion a little bit more. So how do we decide on the most valuable fulfilling goals? I've, I've spoken about that a number of times. We can go back to my episode on values and beliefs. Uh, I believe that one of the ways that we look at our lives, like we we don't have perfect memory. We don't remember everything we did in the past. 
we create a narrative of our life, right? We, we tell a story. We tell a story about ourselves. And conscious, I would recommend, uh, because otherwise it will happen unconsciously. And values, beliefs, and your life narrative are like interwoven, like different stories strands in a tapestry together they build something of substance um what i like to refer to as a as a life worth living so they they work together so one question regarding if accepting yourself believing in yourself and loving yourself is something that you know there's a strong why for you to do that has something to do with going to do a values exercise as I talk about in my episode about values and if acceptance belief and love or truth make it high on your the sort that you do you're listening to the right content but um I also want to inspire you a little bit and tell you why for me these goals or these sub goals are important so we're going to switch from why is the why important so really meta to let's go to the actual why. So why is acceptance important? Accepting yourself. So really it's, if you reverse it, why would you not accept yourself? There's not really like a great answer for it. Like these are one of these common sense things that everybody, if you analyze it, would agree with it. But then again, if it if it's really about yourself, things get a little bit more complicated. So how do you accept yourself, pimples and all? Why would you do that if there's perceived imperfections? And even you might agree with what I previously said, that there's no good reason to not accept yourself and to agree that that's the common sense way of going about it. But then really, if you try to practice that, if you put the rubber to the road, and you want to accept yourself fully there, at least for me, there's a little voice that says, accept that one thing, that one thing that you have. And, you know, just picking up some arbitrary examples like, but my nose is too big, or I've got a gut stuck sticking out, or I have a low key alcohol, porn or junk food addiction, or I'm unable to maintain a relationship. I'm unable to run a mile. Um, I'm not healthy enough. No, those are ones that also need to fit in the acceptance. Why is that? So why is it important to accept these things about yourself that you don't like? Like from a narrative in your life perspective, the fact that you, let's say, well, let's, let's take the inability to run a mile. That that doesn't fit in your life story. You, you don't want that for you. So you don't, you reject that aspect. Why is it important to accept it anyways? It's because what you resist subsists. It's basically means that whatever you push away, it, it will just keep coming back again and again and again and again because it's not being addressed. So... Actually, if I link this to dialectical behavioral therapy, which I talk about a lot, is it one of the key tenets of this methodology, this therapy modality, is that it is seemingly opposite that you have on one side, like on a seesaw, accepting, just radically accepting yourself or things, reality. And on the other hand, there would be change. And Partially, intuitively, you would say is like, no, I want things to change. I'm not accepting how things are. And that's not quite true. So if you look at like mental health research and psychology, the first step of actually, it, it, it's not even the first step. They go hand in hand. But with the radical acceptance, the space for change appears. So why accept yourself? Why is that the right thing? It Because it's effective. Do what works. So this is a, a big major thing in mental health as well. Do what works for you. We are all unique individuals. And of course, I'm telling you this from, from my perspective and the anecdotes that I see around uh, myself. Um, but 
I really see that that works. That accepting yourself fully means making more authentic choices. Because making the inauthentic choices, because you reject something and you don't want it, and you're pretending like you, you know, that doesn't apply to you, it leads you to places that you don't want to go. So the main highlight here is like around, and this is of course a DBT, uh, DBT point, is like accepting yourself. I find that most important. The why behind that is because it's a really effective way of building a life worth living. It's going to help you achieve your goals because the reverse is like there's good evidence against it that you're going to be stuck. So... This is partially that something that you might question. You might not believe me. How, how do I know that? Have I read all the papers? Do I have all the knowledge? No, of course I, I don't. So this is one of the things that you might want to verify for yourself. Sit down, write about it, think about it, journal about it, pause this episode. Right? Verify it for yourself, read a book about it. Maybe you reach a conclusion that's contrary. That is, that is possible. We have our own unique perspectives, right? So let this serve as an inspiration, but that you still have the responsibility to not just accept this as dogma. Having said that, let's move to um, the next piece. What does it mean to believe in yourself? And why is it important? So what does it, be- what does it mean to begin with? It's to be confident that you're able to build up mastery in what you want to achieve, that you are effective, and that you are able to determine what you want to achieve, right? And and the, the way that I got to that is, again, I, I tried to reverse it. What does it look when I don't believe in myself? I, I say, like, oh, I mean, if I have a goal, I'm just, I'm never going to achieve it. I'm just, I'm just going to fuck it up, Um if I don't believe in myself, I immediately find reasons why I can't achieve a goal. And of course, that's not really going to help me achieve my goal. It does give me some kind of like perverse feeling of being right. Because if I don't believe in myself and I don't achieve my goal, I, I was right. So then I'm miserable, but at least I am correct. And that is a, that's an egoic trick. Because the ego loves to be right. Even if it's a bad truth, it loves to be right. So, since we were flipping it around, why wouldn't you believe in yourself? You might have evidence where you disappointed yourself, where you chickened out, you got embarrassed, uh, you have an example of a lifestyle change that you've been trying to uh, do. Maybe it's like yeah, uh, eating clean or working out or getting more like better, better relationships, um, not getting triggered by your family members, various, various patterns that you're stuck in. And maybe you have evidence that shows that, hey, I'm, I'm stuck in the loop. I can't do any better. So here is... Believing in yourself is not necessarily, it doesn't mean that we have to lie and that we get all narcissistic and we think that we're the best things in sliced bread. That, that's not really what we're talking about. It's the belief that we'll eventually get where we want to get with the occasional detour. It's part of the process. So believing in yourself is partially a recontextualization. You can believe in yourself and you be, can be stuck in a pattern, right? That That is possible. You might have to go through this pattern a number of what, times. Maybe you have to do this, like the, this is your karma. You have to do this two, three times. Maybe that's how it is. But you can still believe that going through that pattern consciously builds up a momentum so at one point you can emerge from it right so this is something that i know from um addiction recovery a lot as well i'm gonna mention this somewhere down the episode as well is the um, 
perfection uh, fallacy. If I can't do it perfectly, I can't do. I'm not going to do it at all, right? It's it's just if I and and that is partially a belief problem. It's also a contextualization of that of that belief. It's partially you don't have to do it perfectly. Grab some water. Another thing um, that is really important when it gets to like why it is important to believe in ourselves is that we tap into a different energy. So you might have heard of the five functional ego states. I know it from uh, the book um, Fuck Your Comfort Zone by Margie, Margie Haber, Harbor, Haber, I think. Um, I'm actually doing doing a course at her. It's a uh, she's in uh, acting coach, uh, so I'm actually doing a course at at her studio. That's that's the reason I uh, I read this book. Uh, but I've I've heard of it before. So what are the five um, functional ego states? Uh, it's basically the different voices, like the ego, the different voices of the ego, and gosh. Um, there's the critical parent, judgmental voice. Uh, we probably know it. Like, give yourself a moment to hone in what that voice is for you. There's the nurturing parent as well. There's the fearful child. There's the playful child. And then there's the adult. So those are the five ego states. I'm not going to go... Th- into those in details maybe that's a future episode but i did want to pull out the um, critical parent when we don't believe in ourselves oftentimes we speak to ourselves with that critical parent voice what we really want to do in this situation is speak to ourselves in terms of the nurturing parent in some situations the adult so more about that later because depending on where you are in the process um like i mentioned it really quick i'm gonna i'm gonna repeat myself but the beginning of the process is much more important to get encouragement than correction and compare that to building up any type of skill set like uh, i always think of judo for example in the beginning, it's so much impo- more important to just encourage people to keep to keep coming, to keep trying things, than to say, "Oh, well, that throw that you did is not correct." Like it's at that point, it it doesn't matter. It's going to demotivate you. More about that later. So, getting back to the main thread. So, even of the first iteration of believing yourself is accepting some truly toxic pattern and believing. There's acceptance in there, but also believing that you play it out a few more times, but you get there is it's still belief. It it's not believing in yourself is not an irrational belief. So, again, why would you believe in yourself? It's 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 really because it's effective to getting your goals met. There is nothing really truly there to gain if you if you don't believe in yourself the only thing that you get there is self-pity which can sometimes feel right or something like that this is another thing that i remember from actually the the acting course that i'm doing is that oftentimes is uh, in movies tv series that we watch it's very rare that self-pity is portrayed and it's interesting to think about why there are some situations where you do where there's a reason in the story why you're you're doing that but oftentimes you don't and why is that it's because the audience doesn't want to see it it's it's not a good look and you might be like sort of disdainful of that and be like well that's that's hollywood screw that um but there's something so what what, is, what does hollywood do make stories it's narratives so if there's something that you could put in a story like self-pity that the audience doesn't want to see, why, why would you show it to yourself or show it to your loved ones? 
does it fit in your hero's journey? Where is the hope in there? Where is the belief in there? So I found that insightful. I always like it when I get these like little tidbits of wisdom fr from different angles. Like that you read something in a self-help book and then you see something similar maybe when you're reading about Buddhism, etc., etc. So I, I, I like these things coming together. All right. Let's speed up a little bit. So I talked about why believing yourself is uh, believing in yourself is important. Third thing, how about loving yourself? Isn't loving yourself terribly airy fairy to do? Like, why would I dedicate resources to that? Shouldn't we love sex, money, cars, achievement, or if we're more spiritually minded, thy neighbor, humanity, animals, the planet? the impoverished, the helpless. Yes, and. So, remember the old adage about putting on your own oxygen mask before helping others and pouring from a manti cup. I know it's, it's cheesy, uh, but there is, there is wisdom in, in that. Although, if you're really going deep in loving yourself, it ultimately will collapse in just one capital L love. Um, and now we're really going more into the Buddhism, sort of like things that are often taught in guided meditations. There's just love, right? And it can be pointed at, at different things, right? And, and even you could say hate is a form of love. It's it's just a more pointy version. Uh, because if you hate something, that really means that you love the opposite, right? If you hate Republicans or Democrats, that, that, that means that you love the other side, right? So. so, capital L love doesn't exclude ourselves. And in fact, we'll be able to be more loving to others if we are more loving towards ourselves again. You could interpret this as dogma. How do I know that? Verify it for yourself. Run an experiment. Seriously. I notice that for me, resentment doesn't grow if I do it this way. Again, on the other side, so on team, if I play devil's advocate, trying to find reasons why I shouldn't love myself, the only reasons that come up for me personally, we're going to address a little bit further down, and that's about deserving it. Do I deserve to love myself? Why would I deserve it? And the guy over there wouldn't. Things like that. All right. So a little tangent here. I do find it really interesting to look at the religious traditions as well. So I took a look at Hinduism, Buddhism, Christianity, and Islam. And they generally discourage self-loathing and instead advocate for self-awareness, repentance, in the case of Christianity and Islam, and a pursuit of wisdom and inner realization, truth, as seen in Hinduism and Buddhism. The emphasis is often on love, compassion, and self-improvement rather than self-deprecation. Um, and that might not provide a direct why, except God wills it. But, but don't poo-poo the wisdom in scripture. Remember, church and state used to be one. Society were run in that way. Um, that we don't do that anymore, at least in the Western world, anymore for, for good reasons. But um, maybe we shouldn't question why God wills something, but it probably isn't because it's ineffective, right? So the downside of diving into any religious scripture is it cuts off a little bit of like the, um, um, the exploration process, right? Because it's written and then we're done, right? So there you go. I have unequivocally demonstrated to you that you should, in fact, accept, believe in, and love yourself. You're welcome. Of course, there's lots of personal exploration uh, uh, to do there. 
but I hope that I got some creative juices flowing there. All right. Now, a topic that I promised you, believing that you're worth it. So another key ingredient of achieving a goal, and this is a goal after all, is to believe you're worthy of pursuing this goal. This is actually more of a roadblock or a pitfall. And maybe you think that accepting, believing in, and loving yourself is uh, perfect for everyone else, but not for you. You are the special black sheep to which none of it applies. That shit in this context, of course, can't fly. Um, so this might be actually a roadblock for you. You crash into over and over again, although it's not particularly rational. What is so rotten about you? Um, why are you more evil than, I don't know, murderers and rapists and, and, and whatever? Um, probably that's, that's not the case. So when you inspect that belief, like it, it, it can't really, you know, withstand the light of truth, but still, if you don't expose it, it might still be pervasive. So before you accept, believe in, and love yourself, you also need to make a decision that you are worth it. And this might be a very personal process, and it can be painful to sit with. But I challenge you to journal on this yourself, because there's not that much, because it's such a personal belief that I particularly can say, except that it's ridiculous to state that you you know are not worth it to accept your yourself that that is an irrational point of view but we all have our irrational points of view and what does rationality mean to begin with right so but when you're journaling on it also write about why you wouldn't be worth it and be real about if those were would be actual reasons for it and my prediction is that you will find out that they're not so this may require time and it may be one of these failures. like i said it's it's an obstacle it's a pitfall you, you might start on this journey and then at one point come upon the uh, come upon this limiting belief that you're not worth it right so i'm telling you now this is a pitfall you can expect so expect it to happen. Be on the lookout for it. Now, of course, this comes from my perspective. These are sort of like my vulnerabilities that come, come up. Um, so this might not be relatable to you. You might have had a very different upbringing or childhood experience or whatever I had that makes that pop up for me, that makes this something that I really want to call out, which would be absolutely wonderful and great. So, cool. All right, let's get into the meat and potatoes. How do we actually do it? Because the third step is of goal achievement is that you believe that the continuous investment and the process that you are following moves you closer to achieving the goal. Remember that that's actually really, really important. And we oftentimes get into situations that maybe um, we believe the, the, the previous two, two points that it's like worthwhile to invest in and that we are worth it, but we don't quite know how to achieve it because it's such, such a big, hairy, audacious goal, right? So what's the process? And of course, this is an abstract point. This, is, this applies to all different goals. So we're going to make it more specific to the goal that we were talking about. I like to do this. Let's say that I have a magic wand. And if I wave it, you would instantaneously accept, believe in, and love yourself for the rest of time. Poof. And maybe it's a time-traveling wand. Maybe it's a brain-changing wand. Maybe it's a perception-changing wand. Maybe it's a reality or environment-changing wand. You don't know. You just know that it worked. Nothing externally necessarily is uh, is different. It just worked. So if you imagine that situation, ask yourself, what is different? 
how would you conduct yourself now? How would you make all your decisions and your choices? So some of the examples that I came up with, of course, colored by my biases, that looking at yourself in the mirror and seeing a gut and calling yourself like bad things, disgusting fat, like you probably not do that anymore. You probably have a compassionate response from your nurturing parent. Goofing off and procrastinating at work because you're just lazy? No. No, that's a critical parent voice as well. There's there's a different way to frame that. Not working out because you're just not the workout type. Doesn't fly as well. Right? That's limiting. Not working on your creative endeavor because your ideas are crap anyways and they never turn out. Nope. Working on your creative endeavor, if that's a goal, just pursuing the process, that's the reward in it in itself. Jerking off to porn because you can't get a boyfriend or girlfriend or can't connect with them or whatever. Same situation. You would probably not do that when you believe and accept and love yourself. Binge drinking and being uh, sick the next day instead of socializing, working out, like living your life because either this is just who you are, my genes are wrong, my circumstances are wrong, probably also not the case. And this reminds me of a, gosh, I don't remember which motivational speaker this was. Might be E.T., Eric Thomas, who says... Um, uh, I hear a lot of you you people complaining about the hand that you were dealt. You know, your your daddy walked out on you, your mama wasn't there, you you couldn't finish high school, you didn't there was no money. Um the the reason that I'm in in this situation is I got dealt a bad hand. But I bet that there's someone out there that with that exact same hand that you have, same circumstances same same everything they would be a lot more grateful and get a lot more done with the exact same hand but we don't need somebody else do we because we got you now, maybe a little corny and I'm sure that I don't do it as well as Eric Thomas but it hits home for me it does hit home for me Anyways, moving on. Staying in that dead-end job because you just don't like taking risks. Probably taking risks is part of loving yourself. Believing in yourself that you will handle the risks appropriately. Generally not doing something although you want it because, because excuse, you're not the type for it, you don't have the money, you don't have, you know, you weren't dealt the right cards for it. Probably not in line of what the person would do after that magic wand has has been waved. Not thinking anything, just unconsciously going through life, numbing out with you know drugs, alcohol, whatever, where you can. Doesn't work either. That's that's not what a self loving person would do. And you know that. Eating junk food all the time because you don't like to cook or you don't have money or whatever the excuse is, wouldn't fly either. So these are pretty, pretty clear. There's, there are some of the things that might be in the gray area. I, I, I do recognize that, but a lot of these things are very clear. So we know now with the waving of a magic wand and looking at a couple of examples, we can probably get a, get, get a little bit of a feeling how one who believes in, accepts, and loves themselves would treat certain situations versus in the situation where that, that's not the case. But how do we do it without the magic wand? First of all, self-care. It all starts with self-care. And of course, I borrow a lot of these things from dialectical behavioral therapy. Um, it's so essential. It's the oxygen mask again. It's you can't pour from an empty cup. And it's also like one of these um, things that s seem to be 
opposites, right? Like in order to to do proper self-care, you must first do self-care and it it, it feels it feels like like you can't like a it's a it's a how do you call that a paradox. But some of the greatest things in life are paradoxes. So that's really where 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 it starts. Self-care, deciding that self-care is important, knowing how to care for yourself. And you can probably already tell, it's like if, you know, you accept, believe in and love yourself, self-care is, is part of that. Why would you not care for something you love or someone you love? You, you, you want to care for them. You want to prioritize that care. You want to believe that they are worthy of that care. All right. Second is awareness. So without awareness, nothing changes. So having a mindfulness practice, practicing some kind of faith, spirituality, like you don't have to join any, any cult, but opening yourself to the universe, to the greater self, having some kind of faith can be really, really important. And really, spiritual, spirituality could be a separate point, but the point around awareness is that awareness alone can be curative. So that's, that's worth like exploring by, by itself at one point in the future. But you might have heard that, that saying before. This, the same thing applies here, I, I would say, is that sometimes even just being aware of toxic pattern not even changing it actively just being aware as you go through the motions can already like take care of a certain type of autocorrection so that's also very very important so i recommend i mean i'm a fan of morning uh, rituals so i really recommend uh, journaling meditation in the morning you might prefer to practice mindfulness in a, in a different way um, not in the morning I also like to practice mindfulness a lot uh, again related to DBT skills uh, while walking in preferably in uh, in nature but really engaging the five senses being aware of thoughts um, but mindfulness is very very deep definitely a topic by uh, by itself so partially this episode is um, I'm, I'm <laughs> It's, it's like different uh, road signs. So I'm like now pointing you or towards towards the next thing. And I do realize that I definitely want to do more like of an um, expensive episode with mindfulness has, has brought me because it's such a, it's such a easy word that that can mean so many different things to so many different people. Some people just immediately roll their eyes at it and are like, oh, it's woo woo stuff just like sitting in a lotus pose and chanting om and they don't want don't want to do it, have anything to do with it so it's deeper so another personal um tip that i have and this would apply to any type of goal really is accountability and surrounding yourself with growth oriented people it can be meetups facebook groups therapy groups um like people that are interested in personal improvement and these people are, are, are trying, not everybody is like that. Like some people are just not interested in, in living life consciously in that way. And, and that is okay. That is fine. And probably a lot of your family members, uh, friends are like that. I, I know because my, a lot of my family members and friends are, are like that. And you don't have to throw them away. But it is important to be able to surround yourself with like like-minded people. And when you have that express your commitment let it be known and sometimes you can't tell that to your family because they don't they don't get it they don't get where you are exactly so the moment that you then just spout up some some goal or you want to say like i want to love myself like your mother is not going to understand that maybe she is which would be great for you but so make sure that you find accountability in a group with like-minded people that's also work that's work finding a group of people. But again, to reiterate, meetup, Facebook group, therapy groups can all be um, great. Uh, AA 
uh, or narcotics and arms or, or anyways these these people tend to be focused on personal improvement and generally any type of addiction is to cover up something that requires personal growth like it's honestly most of the time not really about the addiction the addiction is just putting a band-aid over some some pain that so that means that when people turn away from the substance or the the addictive pattern that they then in that group where they have the support talk about their you know personal improvement as well it's it's not just about not taking the substance it would just be that it would be easier next is planning be efficient and use unstructured time well so this is for me one of the um, energy sinks so if i have unstructured time and we need unstructured time in our lives but in a way you can plan the unstructured time and set up like sort of guardrails for the unstructured times for your for yourself so that it doesn't expand into the entire day that's the challenge the challenge is to do it with moderation even moderation itself so what i can recommend for planning ahead is both planning this unstructured time planning relaxing time but also for example trying to follow a methodology like getting things done you can google from Gosh, David Allen, I believe the name of the guy is. Uh, you can also look at if it's more emotional topics that you get stuck in, coping ahead. So DPT has the coping ahead strategy that I've talked about before. So those are two very great resources to help your planning out. This is a, a deeper topic. It, it's, of course, easy to say, oh, yeah, plan better. But I do want to re-highlight it. It's not just about productivity porn just being super efficient no it's also really about planning the unstructured time so the time after relaxation it could fall into self-care but i thought it was important to mention separately so one of the other things that i'm super fond of is another i borrowed uh, dbt terminology for that building mastery right so building mastery is all about getting that feeling of self-efficacy as they call in the mental health uh, field that the belief in yourself right basically and whatever the mastery you want to build up in like that depends on you and um there is many many great speakers on different types like goal setting and achieving goals and of course this is an episode that focuses on a specific goal i, I would say and we talk about some of the abstract principles as well but there's great resources online uh, for that for that as well. And I'll, I'll definitely um, be contributing to the wealth of information that's online uh, as well. But the way that I see it, I like to split up the building mastery in like sort of roughly two categories. One are the big goals that can't ever be finished. And uh, so the big, hairy, audacious goals. And an example of that is live according to my values, right? Because... Today my values are this, and tomorrow my values are that. So it's it's an ongoing thing, right? Uh, but it's still hard. It's still something that every day I can ask myself, hmm, am I living according to my values? And it requires upkeep. It requires me to determine what my values are every quarter or half year or year or something, uh, something like that. They're not like, super dynamic, obviously, right? Uh, and... Also, small goals, second part of the category, that are constantly achieved and recognized as well. So, for example, do a values discovery exercise. You can put that on your calendar and go and do it in an hour or two hours or something like that. And the important thing there as well is to also celebrate it. So, it's really easy to not remember the small goals that we're continuously achieving because they're easy um, but we have to remember that the small goals contribute to the big goals so it's like the um, analogy of the small flywheel that is building momentum for like a much much larger wheel so you have to turn that small wheel like a hundred thousand times for the large wheel to like even do like one revelation but still every like easy turn of that flywheel that you do it, it still helps and i find that very important to 
whenever we're putting energy into something, and this does get a little bit into productivity porn, I, I will I will admit that. So productivity porn being like the 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 movement right now that everybody is so much focused on being productive all the time, right? But I do think is a moment that if if it comes to goals, which is of course productive stuff, to be working towards goals that fit within your bigger goals, right? Because then you're working on your narrative, right? So that's why I like so much to spend some time thinking about what your goals are instead of just arbitrarily spawning new goals. And probably if you're earlier in life, that happens to you more, at least it did for me and later in life. Things of like that suddenly some of your friends are getting into... I don't know, uh, Pokemon or skiing or whatever. You can then think, where does that fit in my narrative? What, do I just want to like do that? And there's a difference here because earlier in life, you want to expose yourself to massive experience. So if you're early, if you're like in your teens or 20s, I would, I would say, go do it. Go ski. Go play Pokemon. Go, go do the thing. Go, you know. Um, Later in life, it can change a little bit because you know yourself better. You know better what you like and what you don't like. So I like to frame these go these small goals in contributing to the bigger goals, depending on where you are in your life phase. So there's much more on build mastery uh, as well. So I uh, refer to, gosh, I don't know off the top of my head what my, uh, it was, I think, emotion regulation part one or part two, where we talk about building uh, building mastery. And building mastery is just super, super essential for our mental health, for our feeling of self-efficacy and building our self-esteem. Very, 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 very important. And a manifestation of our um, accepting ourselves, believing in ourselves and loving ourselves. So, so I do want to talk about as well as like, you won't always know the desired answer or the desired behavior, right? So there's a lot of gray in the real world. And there's chapters, um, like I mentioned before, there's experience to amass, mistakes to make. There's also a ton of self-deception, worthy of an episode by, uh, by itself, where you think you're doing something in line with acceptance, belief, and love in oneself, but actually is, is not, right? But that's a discovery process. That's where we need that awareness for. We can't always predict. We can feel it out and be like, okay, if I do this thing, that's probably going to be fine if I go to this party, if I sleep with this person. That's, that, that doesn't contradict my, my love and myself. And, but then we can discover, well, actually, no, it, 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 it did. But we need awareness for that. So quite, quite important. What you can do today is stop doing the obvious things that go against the, your new decision of acceptance, believe, and love in yourself. Even if that doesn't change a ton of the actual actions, remember as well as that you can do an action, same exact action with a different mindset. So you might not immediately change something out there. So my example that I came up with is you might look in the mirror, notice a gut sticking out, and simply affirming to yourself that you believe that you are on... You, you are learning how to prioritize your health. You need knowledge for that. You are investing 15, 20 minutes, half an hour every day, researching that maybe, like whatever you're doing. And if you do that, even if it takes a week to build up some momentum, you have a lot more momentum than if you would have been hating on yourself for a week. Or you would have noticed that and called yourself like a fat slob or something like that because then you're just reinforcing the same pattern and you're probably gonna pick out on ice cream later because you already don't believe in yourself so if this stuff was instant and guaranteed everybody would be doing it of course and these things tend to be tough that's why we have to be very deliberate in thinking about <laughs> why the why is important the why and the how So I already talked about this earlier. Um, 
the common way to embody this is to talk to yourself from a nurturing parent place. So how you would like a parent to have talked to you. And I don't know how it is for some of the other people that are listening to it. But there's definitely um, differences um, that like ways that I wish my parents would have spoken to me in regards to some of these uh, things. Of course, times are different. Uh, and also realize the different voices. So you can have the nurturing parent versus the critical parent, but also who is that parent talking to? Is it talking to the fearful child, playful child, or even the adult in you? And I know I've not explained these exact ego states uh, at nauseum, but they're pretty straightforward, right? The fearful child, you 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 kind you kind of probably can can feel the energy in yourself. Playful child, you can feel the energy. You can feel what those things would enable you to do. And adult is mentioned as well. Is what I like about the five ego states is that it recognizes that you you are adulting sometimes, but not all the time. Right? It's a mindset you switch into, and that you want to turn off as well. It's very important to. Uh, to limit your adulting, I think. All work and no play makes Jack a dull boy. Cool. So if this is really relating to you, um, or resonating, I should say, uh, I recommend you to explore IFS, Internal Family Systems Therapy. I actually don't know that much about it. I have a friend who does and uh, talks about it regularly. It's one of the topics that I want to go uh, deeper into. Uh, but what I understand of it is basically um, where you focus on giving yourself the parenting that your parent never gave you to recognize where, you know, the critical parent voice is talking to you and replacing it with the parenting that you actually would have wanted. And that can be very awkward because you are familiar with the critical, the critical voice, of course. Note that it can be super hard to not get overwhelmed with all of the changes you want to make. We can't do it perfect, therefore, let's not do it at all. The perfectionism fallacy. So, be aware that that might happen and know that it is a fallacy. I want to go into like sort of somewhat of a personal story. Well, the entire thing, of course, is a personal story, but this might relate to some of you resonate and to others it might not but for me what comes up is the following my critical parent voice or whatever says well whoop de doo that's a nice magic trick you did you waved your wand you did whatever now you um, accept yourself you believe in yourself you love yourself great but what if everybody would do that and who would clean up the toilets at McDonald's and pick up the trash like who who who, who are you to to, to do that um, and that is um, very similar to uh, this perfectionism or nirvana fallacy again. We can't do everything, therefore we sh should do nothing, right? Like, although that voice, there might be, like there's some kind of, it, it makes sense to a certain extent, or we could suspect that we, in that state, our society would break. Right. If we just suddenly all like, you know, we might think that our society actually runs on some toxic beliefs and we don't want society to fall apart. But remember Hume, I talked about him uh, earlier. You can derive an ought from an is. So even if if true that the fact that no one would be picking up the trash or whatever society would collapse doesn't mean that one ought to do something. And m maybe not picking up the trash is just fine because if everybody would, you know, believe in, accept, and love themselves, litter would not be a problem. <laughs> or people that have to pick up the trash, you can still pick up the trash and love yourself. That That's not necessarily at odds with each other. Who, who knows? I think that this partially has to do with um, deserving it as well. So they're very, very closely, closely related. So whenever your mind is coming up with those kind of like tricks to try to make it not relevant to you, be aware of what's, what's going on, right? Don't believe the fallacies. 
The point is you are not responsible for fixing the world. You are responsible for consciously establishing your own values, your preferences, your beliefs, and acting in accordance uh, with them. That's it. That's all what we got to do. And the more conscious you do that, the better. Cool. Well, I want to move to a conclusion, round this up. I do want to um, uh, reiterate the um, different steps that I just spoke about. So it, specifically, if, if we want to bypass our human non-short-term dopamine goal attainment system, so just like going for like the little goodies um, that are right in front of us, uh, which is what most of us are doing. Like we're not setting intentional goals. We're just, we're just, we're following the shinies. Um, for goal achievement, we have like, uh, we can call them the three noble truths for mnemonic purposes. The first one that we talked about is uh, you believe the goal or the pursuit thereof is valuable and is worth continuous investment inherently not because of the results. Not that the results are not valuable, still. Second is you believe you're worthy of pursuing this goal, which we identified as more of a roadblock or a pitfall that you can fall into, not feeling like I'm not gonna do it because I don't feel worthy of it. And number three, you believe that the continuous investment and the process you are following moves you closer to achieving the goal, right? So believing that the process works and that the investment, you know, helps you to get uh, to get there. Those those are one, are very very important uh, here. So that's more the the abstract goal attainment principles that we uh, that we learned. Those can be applicable to many different situations in uh, in life, and I think the goal that we talked about is sort of like the biggest goal in in life, accepting believing in and loving yourself really boils down to living a, a life worth living, the, the good life. That does not mean the easy life, but the good life. So the ultimate goal in a, in a way. According to me, and you can, you know, how do you say that? Um, qualify that goal in different ways. Like for me, it feels like one of the most important things to do in, in life, it's it's concrete enough that I can do like these small steps toward it, and I can see the value in it. Very like I can see that there's a lot of value in it, so it's it's a really great combination uh, for for me personally. But it might be different for uh, for you. So wonderful! Um, thank you very much for tuning in. This has been Vincent for the Meaningful Shit Show. Like always, I'm. Uh, Grateful that you uh, made it to the end of the video, if, if you did, but otherwise you wouldn't hear that. Excellent. All right, well, I'm signing off, and I will be looking forward to seeing you next time. See you later.